Good morning and welcome to St. Paul. Good morning. How is everyone this morning? Okay? Good. Good. Things have obviously changed in the state of Pennsylvania and everywhere else. And of course, the governor announced some significant changes on Thursday afternoon. We have not had the opportunity to ponder those changes in any detail yet. However, I've invited the church council to do that immediately after today's worship service. And in conversation with a few of you, if you would like to remain as well, and this is not going to be a lengthy, extended meeting, but if you would like to stay for, say, 10 to 15 minutes after the worship service, so that we can consider what might happen next Sunday and then Christmas Eve and forward. You are welcome to do that and you would be receiving that information firsthand. If we do make any changes at all, those changes of course will be announced in detail through email, but we're aware that some of you don't have that, so as changes will go forward, we'll try to connect with you through the phone. I think there's a pretty good informal network here at St. Paul for that. Uh, in looking at what other churches are doing and between Friday and, and this morning, probably spent a good two and a half hours looking at what everybody else in Monroe County is doing or has been doing. And I think at this point, we really do need to consider what our options might be. So with that in mind, we welcome you to today's worship service because this is the only worship service at the moment that we are, are guaranteed and we are happy to be together with you. And we have some a guest vocalists today, a few guests. Uh, Pastor Boggess' wife will be singing for us. And we are very happy once again to have you with us, Pastor Boggess. And let us begin our worship service. Oh, wait, one more announcement. I forgot. Go ahead, Beth. The Christmas. In honor of our new Christmas for our Christmas tree this year, all the girls have shared with everybody the Christmas to take home for their trip. I hope you enjoy it and read the story of the Christmas. Thank you. And Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to everybody. Sunday of Advent, the Sunday of joy, and it is a joy to take that thing off for a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Blessed be God, the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, whose forgiveness is sure and whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Together let us honestly and con humbly confess that we have not lived as God desires loving and forgiving God. We, we are compounded by sin. In spite of our best efforts, we have gone astray. We have not welcomed the stranger. We have not loved our neighbor. We have not been Christ to one another. Restore us, O oh God. Wake us up and turn us from our sin. Renew us each day in the light of Christ. Amen. Amen. People of God hear this glad news. By God's endless grace, our sins can be forgiven. And you are free, free from all that holds us back and free to live in the peaceable realm of God. May you be strengthened in God's love, comforted by God's peace, and accompanied with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Blessed are you, God of might and majesty, for you promise to make the desert rejoice and blossom, to watch over the strangers and to set the prisoners free. This third candle symbolizes joy and is called the shepherd's candle. To the 
shepherds' great joy, the angels announced that Jesus came for humble, unimportant people like that. To in in, in, in liturgy, the color rose signifies joy. Joy. This candle is colored pink to represent joyfulness and rejoicing. As we light these candles, satisfy our hunger with our good gifts, open our eyes to the great things you have done for us, and fill us with patience until the coming of the Lord Jesus. O ransomed people of the Lord, come. Let us travel
Vice Chancellor and of the President. The second reading from the Thessalonians, in which Paul concludes his letter of the Thessalonians by encouraging them to live lives of continued joy, prayer, and thanksgiving. The closing blessing is grounded in the hopes of Christ's coming. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. The word of the Lord.
the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Praise the Lord. Perhaps there is no event in the calendar year that contains more references to joy than in this season. The word appears frequently on Christmas cards and advertisements and songs and banners and communications of all types. Between people that we know and people that we do not know. American greens and Hallmark cards abound with scenes with smiles on everybody involved. On Mary, on Joseph, and even on the angels. Perhaps you've seen cards that it would almost seem like the, the animals are smiling as well, but they have joy at this event. Although the emotion of joy and is referenced to in this account by the angel is certainly valid and an understandable part of the Christmas event. It is not something, however, that as I read this story is really coming through in the lives of the principal participants especially Mary and Joseph. If we look at it through the eyes of just a superficial glance, we would think, what is there to be joyful about? But if we look at it through the eyes of heaven, as we see both pictures here described in this account, we can say with certainty that this is good news of great joy. Let me give you the background of the story because you already know the story very well. But let me give you a little bit of the background. Actually, Luke refers to the first actor in this story as Augustus Caesar. Augustus was born Gaius Octavius or Octavian in 63 BC. He was the grand nephew and adopted son of Julius Caesar. When he was 18, Julius Caesar was assassinated. As, there, as heir, Octavius entered into a power struggle for the throne and for Rome. In a few years, he defeated both Cassius and Brutus with the hard help of Antony. Eventually, he gained control of the Roman world at a battle of Acticum in BC 31. There he defeated Mark Antony and Cleopatra, who later committed suicide. That victory brought Egypt also under Roman rule. And now they ruled the entire known world. Some claim that Octavian was really not much of a military leader or very brave. In fact, he was something of a hypochondriac that he used on various occasions to avoid going to battle. But we won't get into that. He was also, however, a cruel man, even ruthless. And he is mentioned only one time in Scripture in this account that I know of. After Jesus was born, he continued to reign some 14 to 20 years, approximately. The Roman Senate honored him with the title Augustus. It is the name from which we get August in our calendar year. Augustus meant reverend. And by the way, I didn't know that was where my title came from, and I share that with Augustus Caesar. Isn't that great? <laughs> well, just a side bit of information. So it, it meant reverend, exalted one, venerable one, and it kind of all breaks down for me there. But Augustus' 45-year reign was known as Rome's Golden Era. And then at his death, the Roman Senate officially declared him to be a god. Octavius had coins made with his image on one side that declared Caesar the son of a god, and on the other, God Julius, associating himself with a very revered and worshipped leader, Julius Caesar. The larger scene in the circumstance does not really say much about joy for a baby in our faith being born. Herod, the ruler over Galilee, still ruled. Roman troops still occupied their, 
their country, their lives, their religion. Roman troops still marched up and down the streets. And they had to be careful at all times because anything that would displease Rome could lead to harsh and swift retribution. Scarcely a day would pass without an execution under the rule of Herod. Jesus entered into this world. That is what Mark, that is what Luke is referring to here. During a time of the rule of Augustus, this is the world that Jesus was born. Tuck that information away as a background because I'm going to come back to it a little bit later and you'll see perhaps how it relates. This is what led Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem. It was due to a decree that Caesar wanted everybody to be registered, to have a census. He already was the emperor of the world, basically. He already had all the wealth that any person or any uh, nation or any uh, kingdom could want. But he wanted that, that egotistical, he wanted that power, he wanted that knowledge, whether it's to be used for more taxation, I'm not sure. But he sent out a decree that everyone would be taxed. Now get this. 600 years before this decree, the prophets in the Old Testament said that Jesus the Savior would be born in Bethlehem. But he wasn't living in Bethlehem. Or, excuse me, he wasn't, uh, his parents weren't living in Bethlehem. They were in Nazareth. So in order to get from Nazareth to Bethlehem, God used the most powerful man in the world to bring about the fulfillment of that prophecy. You could look at it differently as coincidence, I don't. I see it as a fulfillment of what God designed and planned. So the decree was fulfilled and fulfilling that prophecy. Now I want to look at it. This is the sermon title, Christmas Joy. Really? Joseph was among the poor of his time. A simple carpenter that probably made just enough to keep body and soul together. A good man who lived by principle, which was evident throughout his story as we understand him. But to romanticize his part in the months leading up to this event is a mistake. And to see and to impose upon him what we want to see in this event is an error. Let his life and circumstance speak for itself. Joseph was as human and subject to all normal human emotions as any man. He had endured now for nine months the whispers, the slander, the treatment from others that projected a condemning attitude toward him and his wife for what they were experiencing. Although Joseph wasn't carrying the baby, he was carrying his own burden. I can imagine that there were times when Joseph was absolutely confident that Mary was a good person, deeply spiritual, religious, and devout. And all that she had told him of the angel's message and what was occurring in his life and her life. I'm sure at times he could have absolute confidence, but don't you think that there were moments of weakness and question? It wasn't that he was an unbeliever in God's ability to perform a miracle. He's like us, that when we are confronted with interpreting a specific event, it's hard for us to really say, that was a miracle of God, that was God working. We have faith. We just can't see it necessarily in our lives. It's not mature. It's not strong. I can imagine that he had weak moments in his own struggle with everything. Questions and nagging doubts that he at times had to fight off as an overwhelming flood. Forced to take a long distance in a journey meant for him in poverty, missing work for probably several weeks. He probably earned only enough to keep body and soul together as it was. And now, this powerful man, irregardless of any problem he created, sounds familiar, is saying, you need to do this. And so, they had to start out on their track. From the beginning, 
it was hardship. But don't think of that particular event in the glowing golden boss cards that we look at today. I think it was something that contained all the emotions that the human being could experience. Both those that burden and those that would lift. Both those that put us in touch with God and those that would make us question God. That was Joseph. The event throughout didn't prompt much joy for Mary either. From the very beginning, Mary had only one person that she could talk to that she probably believed understood her. And that was Elizabeth, her relative and the mother of John the Baptist. Elizabeth's husband, Zachariah, had had an angel appear to him and to tell him that your wife, who was already well beyond age-bearing years, is going to have a child. And this child, and the predictions were made, and this was going to be John the Baptist. John the Baptist was going to be the one to set the stage for the ministry of Jesus. And Mary knew of this, and when Mary received the angelic message of what was going to happen to her, she began to actually feel that and to begin to show. I can imagine she is someone who genuinely could understand and believe her. And I think it was Elizabeth. I can imagine that she talked with Elizabeth many times about the event, about what she was feeling, and the fact that no one seemed to believe. And everybody looked at her just a little sideways, thinking, sure, right. But Mary knew, and she had one person with whom she could find comfort and solace. For a woman to carry a child in the circumstances that Mary did would be difficult, and I want you to know in advance, ladies, I am not presuming to know all of this as I look at the story, so please, cut me a break. <laughs> I know enough about human nature and working with people. I'm in dangerous territory, okay? But nonetheless, for a woman to bear and to be pregnant and to be in these circumstances, can you imagine with me? I want us to understand what really happened in this event. Without the benefit of emotional, medical community and spiritual support, she was a woman that was very much more than a pregnancy. Enduring, notice enduring, not enjoying, enduring the will of God in her life was a day-to-day -day challenge of faith and endurance and tolerance. It must at times raise even deep questions within her herself. I can think there were moments in her life when perhaps she would think, I was told that I was favored by God by this privilege. And I can just imagine at times thinking, God, I just wish you had not picked me. I wish you had passed a lot. And then on top of it all, at the very time when she was the most uncomfortable in pain, knowing the child was going to be born at perhaps any time, the news is they have to travel to Bethlehem. Do you know how far it was from Nazareth to Bethlehem? It wasn't from here to Hinkley. It's more like from here to Philadelphia. Can you picture with me the response to Mary at the news when she received that. She is incredibly uncomfortable. It could happen at any moment. And they have to make a hundred mile journey. Now, a hundred miles is not much for us. I drive that nearly to work every, nearly every day. We commute, we think nothing other than our superhighways and our cars. But keep in mind, that's not what it was back then. The pictures that you will see in cards is Mary riding on a donkey and, and uh, Joseph supporting me and, and carrying me and walking alongside. That's not the story. They were probably too poor to have one. They were too poor to afford any kind of help in any way. So get this, it was on foot. 100 miles on foot. Not on the pathways, the railway systems we take, we ride, we enjoy, we have fun, we say, wow, wasn't that refreshing, wasn't that great? No, 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 no. A 
hundred miles in terrain that was difficult. Sleeping for days, probably taking more than a week, maybe two weeks to get to the destination, sleeping out in the cold in the elements. You can't think with me, surely. Mary question, Lord, this is too much. Why? It's sometimes taxing for a lady to go to the grocery store when they are pregnant at that stage. And yet she had to make a trip of 100 miles now. Now, I, I think I'm fairly close to saying that was asking a lot. Any of the ladies, if you want, if your husband wants to ask, you can turn to them and you can confirm that. That was a lot. That was the prelude to this night. We take this night out of the context and we look at it and we give it sort of fantasy features and we give detail to it that really wasn't there. It makes it more palatable. We were told that she was born in an inn, or that there were no inns, and that she had to go to a stable. Actually, there were no inns in Bethlehem. It was a very small village, probably smaller than, as I refer to, Henryville. What the scripture is referring to about where she gave birth was actually a place for relatives or company within the peasant's home. One room. And the home was divided. And one small area, not a room, a separate room in our house, like in your house, you probably have that bedroom you keep pristine, and it's the guest bedroom. You don't use it. It looks nice. Nobody ever uses it, right? We have that. But there was no guest room. It was a guest area that peasants would have, and caught perhaps in a corner for a visiting person. And according to the story, what wasn't available was not even that. So what was available for them? An area that was another part of the peasant's home, dug out four feet deeper than the one side. And there would be a little ramp that goes down to it that the animals would go down and up into that space. It was the stable within the peasant's home. That was her maternity boy. See now at that night as she begins to feel the first pains of childbirth. I don't see joy in the weeks and months preceding, and certainly not at that night. And if there's any joy at all, it's after the birth. Thank God, that's over. But there were those who had joy in this event. It's interesting. There are those buried under tremendous stress and strain, and yet we do see joy in this event. Joy, in fact, is supernatural. Supernatural to the point that it is able to be enjoyed by the world and by all people and of all times. But strangely, those who demonstrated and referred to this joy were not the principal characters in the story. They were the peripheral. They were the ancillary people. How often I hear people who are in my counseling room and I will hear of somebody who's going through a tragedy or just suffered a tremendous blow of some kind. And they will tell me of their feelings of anger and of frustration by people coming and tell them, well, I know such and such happened, but you ought to be thankful. You've heard that, right? Hopefully you've never said it. But the principal characters just turn from them and look at the shepherds, the angels. Listen to the words of this angel. Imagine his demeanor and his body language that came to the shepherds that night. I want you to see him more what the Bible describes. Not as the angel that is hovering with a placid kind of serene look. Listen to the language. Listen to what he says. Fear not. That's a command. He's not in a very, very soft way. Don't, don't be upset. I've got some news for you. This is, you know, but no, 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 no. 
This is an angel with authority, power. This is an angel with a message. This is a herald giving a message from the king. Fear not. Don't be afraid. It's awful quiet in here. You're probably thinking I'm French right now. <laughs> it gets better. The angel announced that Jesus would bring joy to all the world of all times. To the distant observer, this message was surprisingly simple and unimpressive. The angel declared that there would be a baby born in the sea of David. So, so what? Babies are born all the time. Really? God sent an angel to tell us that a baby was born, and it was born for me. I didn't ask a baby to be born for me. I don't need a baby in my life right now. <laughs> Could you imagine? If you look at it in just simply the superficial way, I think the angels could have been so incredibly under-impressed, except for two things. The medium of the message was an angel, and two, the message connected to Old Testament prophecy prophecies that they knew about. They had heard, they had been taught that a deliverer would come, a savior would come. He would be born of the house of David. He would be a savior and he would save his people and deliver them. Shepherds were as scorned and devalued as perhaps any people on earth at the time. They were, sent, they were perhaps only a step above a leper. And during that day, a leper, everybody avoided completely. You don't touch it up, you don't go around, you're afraid to get uh, the disease and so forth. And so that was the life of the shepherd. The outcasts. These shepherds to whom that message came to, they weren't just tending the sheep that night. And then they would go home and at, at night or in the morning and sleep in a nice warm bed. No, the life of a shepherd was really rough. They lived with the sheep. They would construct tents and they would live out in the cold and the elements. Their main purpose for existence, their only value, was to protect the sheep. That's how society viewed them. But I find it interesting that God made this message known to them first. It wasn't heaven's intent that there would be a huge announcement and that it would be a big event. It was simply heaven's intent that it would give the message to someone who then would carry it to others. And they could look at the prophecies and see for themselves something was happening. The angel said he would be Savior, Christ the Lord. The title is described him as a man above all men, fully human and yet fully unique. Lord in the Greek includes the concepts of being a master, having power, authority, competence, and ability. So the Hebrew understanding would be just as in the Old Testament, God is referred to as a deliverer, as a savior in many different scriptures. He was that way with the Israelites in Egypt and delivered them. You know, I was, as a, as a, as you know my background, as I work in therapy, I sometimes see things differently. And I had the privilege of meeting with people in all situations, rich, poor, educated, uneducated, in stress and distress and comfort and you name it. But what I would look at when I see this is, I would have loved to have gotten inside the head of the angel. What was the angel thinking? What was the angel experiencing in this moment? What was it that they were be thinking in their response to what was taking place? And I text this. I imagine that the angels were in amazement at this event. Think of it. The one whom they knew as God. The one who they had worshipped for thousands and millions of years. 
was humbling himself, shrinking himself down to the infinitesimally small picture of a baby. You say that's fantasy. No, that's scripture. Because Christ was, Christ was alive from all eternity before. And that is the one that is coming. So think of what the angel was thinking, imagining why he knew this. I can assure you that if I had been privileged to live in a mansion with servants at my call and, and my bidding, and I had everything, I don't think I would in any way even consider leaving that to come to the third planet of this small solar system. What people don't realize is this. What we don't understand is this. The nativity is cute. But the nativity meant that God's son was taking a risk. Not just for 30 some years to be here and endure. He was taking a risk. Get this. That if he did not live a perfectly holy life, he would be as guilty as we are. And would lose everything. By judgment of the Father. I don't know if you've ever thought about it. This wasn't a temporary period of endurance that he was willing to do for us. No, no, no. This was a permanent risk of everything for us. Alfred Vanderbilt was the great grandson of Cornelius Vanderbilt. He left school at the age of 11, to go and make his fortune in shipping and railways. Cornelius left the equivalent of about $150 billion in today's money to his son Alfred, who then doubled the family fortune because he was an astute manager. Vanderbilt set sail off from New York in May of 1915. He was going to a meeting in Britain for business. And even though the waters of the Atlantic were teeming with German U-boats, it was assumed that because it was a non-military ship, that they would be left alone and would be safe. How wrong they were. On the morning of May the 7th, 1915, the ship was attacked off the coast of Ireland. It soon became clear that it was going to sink. Vanderbilt, of course, was in the first class section of the ship. And as such, he had a light jacket and provisions for his safety. He gave his life jacket away and he assisted individuals to get into life boats and with light jackets. He could have easily gotten into one of those boats because of his status and the knowledge that others had of who he was. But he didn't do so. Hour, minute after minute, person after person, he assisted others until finally it was too late for him. The ship went down. His body was never recovered. There are moments that are rare in human history that we can point to that says that was a spectacular, a spiritual even, gift of self for others. But that doesn't begin to compare with what Jesus did in that moment for us. Jesus didn't begin in the divine story. He existed eons of times before, and he only chose to become a baby because he had a mission. What was that mission? Salvation. We live in two worlds. In Bethlehem that night, these two worlds collided. Heaven intersected earth in the birth of Jesus the Christ. Deity emptied himself of all the powers and the privileges rightfully that belonged to him. And it was the beginning of the fulfillment of him becoming able to be our Savior 
at the most important level of our existence, not physical, but spiritual and eternal. If you're not sure of the story of meaning and power, imagine for a moment that it is true. If you have doubts, fine. But just ask yourself if what others believe is true, if what the Bible says is true, how incredible that must be. To make this even more astounding is that Jesus did it knowingly, willingly, completely, voluntarily. He was not commanded by the Father. He volunteered. Now we begin to understand where the joy is in this story. The joy is all of us need the Savior. We all need deliverance. From what? From first of all, the last and great enemy that we all face, death. Jesus came to deliver us from the sentence of death. And by his life, his death, and his resurrection, we now have a hope of eternal life. Not just eternal existence, but eternal life with eternal joy. Think of the most distressing, the most painful, the most imprisoned moment of your life when you wish somebody could have stepped into the room and said, I can heal your mother. Or I can do this. Or I can take care of that for you. Well, what did it mean to you? It can't compare to what has already been done by Jesus. And it began on this moment. Chernobyl, April 26. 1986, scientists got a, to work on a series of tests in Unit 4 of the reactors in the nuclear power plant. As the tests unfolded, things began to go wrong, very, very wrong. Two explosions walked the unit. Two engineers were killed instantly, but that was just the start of the problem. More seriously, a fire has started in the graphite moderator reactor, which I don't fully understand, but this is the story. Radioactive smoke began to plume out of the facility into the sky. Forty-nine workers quickly fell ill and died within a few weeks. The accident that meant that more radioactive fallout was sent into the atmosphere than was caused by either of the nuclear bombs that were dropped in World War II. The damage was massive, but it could have been much worse. A second explosion could have caused the whole complex, all of the reactors, to have melted down. Had this happened, and I'm not trying to dramatize, but it is predicted they would spread over half of Western Europe. Thankfully, a second explosion was avoided thanks to three men, now known today as the Chernobyl Three. Three men that would go down in history. After the explosion, the plant's chief became seriously worried that the reactive material was traveling to a flow towards a cool pool of water under the reactor. If that flow met with that pool, it would have called an explosion, a second steam explosion destroying all three reactors. Someone had to go into that pool and drain it physically. Two plant workers and one soldier stepped forward and volunteered. The basement of the reactor, the reactor was extremely uh, highly radioactive. Even if they could do what the mission was, they knew they would probably die. It was a suicide mission. In darkness and in treacherous conditions, the three men put concerns of their own safety aside. And they went into that pool, found the correct balance, 
and opened and drained it. Three men stepped into the darkness beneath a molten radioactive core and put the good of everyone else before their safety. And they knew they would die. And they did. This doesn't begin to compare with what Jesus did. It doesn't begin to compare with what really happened. The reason the angels were singing, the, the chorus behind the angel that made the announcement is because they saw so much more in this story than we ever see in our usual superficial understanding of the nativity. It was the incarnation of God becoming man. And why on earth would he do that? Because it was the only way to deliver us from that that oppressed us, sin and death. But because he came, we can have victory over both. Victory over both, that means we can live with God forever. Jesus came, he lived, he died, he was resurrected, he's coming again for us. There's tremendous joy at this time if we understand the depth of the meaning of this image. May God help us as we see, as we are reminded by so many different things around us. May it prompt in us a deeper understanding and a joy that is eternal because of it.
three. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. God of power and might, shine your radiance and come quickly to this new world. Hear our prayers for everyone in the God of preachers and messengers, you have entrusted your church with the work of proclaiming good news. Strengthen the witness of bishops and pastors, deacons, church musicians, lay leaders, and all people who contribute their prayers and talents to public worship. Embed your word in their hearts and hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of every living creature, you announce the year of your favor for all creation. Extend your kindness and relief to endangered animals and plants. Strengthen the human beings who rely on the rhythms of nature to make your living. Hear us, O oh God. God of all peoples and nations, you plant us as your oaks of righteousness and ask us to care for one another. Be present with the leaders of every nation as they govern. Give them a spirit of righteousness, that your goodness and mercy is revealed through their actions. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of exiles and wanderers, you repair what was once destroyed. We pray for people who have been displaced from their homes by fire and flood, earthquake or storm. Support the work of Lutheran World Relief. Lutheran Disaster Response, and all disaster relief organizations in their recovery efforts. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of the powerful and helpless, you clothe us with strength when our spirits are weak and weary. Bestow your spirit upon this congregation and empower us to comfort the people who turn to us in time of need. Make your church a place of refuge and healing. Hear us, O oh God. God of sinners and saints, you offer joy even in the midst of grief. We are grateful for the beloved, imperfect people whose lives testify to your radiant love. Anoint all who mourn with the oil of gladness. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Draw near to us, O God, and receive your prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And now the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I am the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The creator of the stars, bless your hand and we, the long awaited Savior, fill you with love. The unexpected spirit guide your journey now and forever. Amen. Amen.
He was the one that the world said was Savior. Gospel good news was actually coined from the fact that he was going to bring a new world order to the whole world. That wasn't completely fulfilled. He died. Jesus is Lord. The good news is Jesus is alive. He is Lord. And his kingdom is forever. Go in peace. Prepare the way of the Lord. Thanks be to God.